Hello and welcome to Tuesday Tips. I'm Pam Keslauskas, and today we're going to be talking about mastering the MOR. We're going to have a series of these. The first thing we're going to be talking about is EIV, and we're going to focus on the tenant files today. It's really important that your EIV records be complete on site so that you don't lose points to MOR findings. The first thing we're going to talk about is certifications. So with HOTMA, this is going to change some. Remember, with HOTMA, for anything April 1st or later, that's the effective date, you're going to use just what's in EIV. EIV should be updated by then. So for any certifications that are effective April 1st or later, you're going to use just what's in EIV. If you are doing certifications, say, you know, September, November, you're not going to have what their social security is going to be in the next year. So you may be pulling EIV in, say, September or October. It is a really good idea to, idea to pull EIV again if that certification isn't signed until, say, March, so that you can make sure you have the accurate information, or you're going to be manually adding that COLA, the cost of living increase, if you are processing that early. Again, it's going to take a little while for it to hit the EIV system, and HUD says with HOTMA, you must now use the COLA in addition to whatever award you're seeing, say, in September through December. So make sure that anything that is going to be effective January 1st, 2025 and later has that COLA taken into account. What you're doing currently, remember, is a little different. So pre-HOTMA, you have several options. You can just use what's in EIV with no further calculations at all. Um, I tend to think this is the easiest way to do things. Makes it very simple for you. You look at EIV, that's the number you use. Or you can use what's in EIV and then add the cost of living increase for anything that's effective January or later. Or you can ask the tenants for their award letter, which is usually available in December or so. So whichever of those approaches that you use, you just want to make sure that you're being consistent with whatever your management policy is. And again, once HOTMA takes effect, you're going to be adding that COLA every certification after January 1st. So let's talk about what we do with applicants. With applicants, you're going to be asking them for an award letter or a benefit statement. You're going to use the amount that's noted in that letter. And depending on your policy, if they bring you either a benefit statement or their December letter, how you handle this and how you handle the COLA is going to depend on which one of those you use. If you get their December award letter, that's already factoring in the COLA, so you can just use that. If you get a benefit statement, you may need to add the COLA. Or if it's in June, and I'm dealing with half of the year and half of the year with COLA, you may need to add it. But that's based on what your owner policy is right now. After HOTMA, again, you're required to account for the COLA. So again, just some reminders for you. When you are using award letters and benefit statements with your initial certifications or with your move-ins, you need to make sure that they are dated within 120 days of receipt by the owner. So if I am doing a certification effective August 1st, I cannot use their award letter from December 2023. I need to ask them to get something more recent. Pre-HOTMA, so pre-January, you can set the policy in terms of whether you add that COLA or not. And the big thing to remember is you have to use a consistent policy. So if your policy is to add COLA, you need to do that with everybody. One of the findings that we are seeing on MORs out there is inadequate documentation of discrepancies. 
either there's no documentation or there's not detailed documentation. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we document those discrepancies. When there is a hit on the reports, the multiple subsidy report, your new hires report, income discrepancies, you should be documenting your resolution efforts in the tenant file. Generally, what people do is they put a report and a copy of those resolution efforts in the master file. What has to be in the master file is the actual report, the resolution effort. So your phone calls, your verifications, anything that you did to look at the discrepancy, that all gets kept in the tenant file. Now, what a lot of people do is they document the resolution efforts, they take that original and put it in the tenant file, they take a copy and put it in the master file, and that's fine. The key to remember, though, is that those resolution efforts must be in your tenant file. There's a little confusion on how exactly these things should be documented. So you'll see what an EIV report looks like on the screen here. That's completely mocked up. So nobody's information is being put out on Tuesday tips. Um, when you look at these, the important thing to remember is that HUD is looking at a specific time frame in the past and comparing it to what you've entered on your most recent 50059. So you'll see that the period of income here is given, but that's, you know, 2022 to 2023 or the full year of 2023, but it's a long way before now. So a lot of things could legitimately have happened between then and now. You could have somebody that had a job and got injured and lost their job before they came into affordable housing. You could have somebody who retired. You could have someone who was laid off. So there can be a lot of legitimate reasons why this income doesn't match up. So when you see one of these, the first thing that you're going to do is go to your tenant and say, hey, we were reviewing the EIV reports and you are showing as a discrepancy. You give them an opportunity to take a look at it and give you an explanation. If I say to you, oh yeah, that was before I moved in here. I was working and then I got injured and I had to leave my job. You're going to look for some documentation. You may have that already in your file. When I moved in, you may have verified that I lost my job and that I'm not working and you may have that already. But you have to have something on that report that tells everybody what you did. So you'll see a sample down here. This is somebody who had an income discrepancy come up. And what the note says is that the resident was employed. The employment was noted on the move-in. We spoke with the store manager where they worked. We verified the termination of employment date. And we had done an interim at that time, so there's nothing further needed with the manager's name and the date that all, that all happened. So here is a comprehensive note in the file that says, yes, there was a discrepancy. We investigated it. There's nothing we need to do about it. And that's the end of it. And this would go in the tenant file. So you want to make sure at any point that you are seeing these reports or with a recertification that your tenant has the opportunity to review it and to dispute it if necessary. Particularly with the ARs, you are now going to make sure that you've documented that. You always were supposed to be letting your tenants look at the report, but now HUD is very clear that they want to see something that documents that the tenants had the right and the opportunity to review these. How that happens is a matter of management policy. I have seen some management companies that just have the resident sign a copy of the EIV report, the one that's in the file indicating that they looked at it. Some people do a separate acknowledgement just for EIV. 
and some people will put that in the the acknowledgement of the forms that somebody gets at research that list in there. I had an opportunity to review my EIV report, but you're going to want to be putting something in the file that shows everyone that you gave that tenant an opportunity to review and to dispute it if they wanted to. If they dispute the information in EIV, you're going to look for additional documentation. Another one of the findings that we see very frequently is conflicting information. We get in the habit in housing of more documentation is always better. And unfortunately, in this case, it's not because you can get yourself in a position where you have two conflicting sources of information. Let's say I'm doing a certification in October and I pull EIV and EIV is a number that is not accurate for January because that's when COLA is going to kick in. So... I also take the award letter when my tenant gets it. Where we have a problem is when I do EIV plus the COLA versus the award letter, they may be different numbers. Or you'll see that EIV is rounded numbers and a statement of benefits may have pennies. And those are conflicting sources. So if you have EIV and it's accurate, you always want to use EIV and you can get rid of any extra documentation that you have. However, your company does that. Usually it's shredding and you can note that duplicate information had EIV award letter shredded on X date or you can return it to your tenant. But you want to have one source of information that's accurate. If you have a dispute, you may need to get additional sources of information. You're also going to note tenant disputed EIV. They said they were getting $1,250.75. So we got a statement of benefits and that says that. When you're documenting, you want to be documenting to somebody that would never have seen your file before. So the goal is... I should be able to go into your file and know exactly what's going on. So remember again, when you're getting your MOR, you want your reviewer to be able to get in, get through those files quickly and easily, and then leave as early as possible because you want to get back to your work. You have a lot of things going on and the less time we have to spend reviewing it means more time for you to get back to your work. So always use one source of information that's accurate, usually EIV. The exception to that is sometimes when you have multiple regulatory bodies at your property. You really do want to be keeping separate, mostly duplicate files for multiple regulatory bodies. For instance, USDA, um, tax credit, and some of the state bodies, they technically cannot see what's in EIV. They're not authorized to see those printouts. So you want to make sure they're not seeing the EIV things. And those of us looking at HUD compliance are not really supposed to be looking at other regulatory body documents. So it's a really good idea to have some way that People who are reviewing HUD compliance only see HUD documents. People who are looking at, say, LIHTC compliance are only seeing the relevant documents they have. In some cases, that means you're going to make, be making two copies of things, birth certificates, social security cards. But in some cases, there are documents that are signed for one regulatory body that are not going to be signed for another regulatory body. That is all I have for you today. Again, my contact information for me and for Vicki Bell, our other corporate trainer, is on the slide up here. And please don't hesitate to reach out to your local Navigate reps or to us if you have any questions. Thanks and see you next time.